Now we come to two Bible readings, read for us in order by Jonathan Fernandez and then by Richard Amazon. Thank you. The first reading is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. Romans chapter 8, verses 31 to 39. This can be found on the back portion of the Bible on page 196. In view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not also freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then will condemn them? Not Christ Jesus, who died, or rather, who was raised to life and is at the right hand side of, the, of God, pleading with him for us. Who then can separate with him for us? Separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble do it? Or hardship or persecution or hunger? Or poverty or danger or death? As the scripture says, for your sake we are in danger of death at all times. We are treated like sheep that are going to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are complete victory for him who loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever be able to separate us from the love of God which is ours through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is taken from the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 1 to 10. And this can be found in the Pew Bible, back of the page, page 44. After the Sabbath, as Sunday morning was drawing, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Suddenly there was a violent earthquake, and an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled the stone away and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid that they tumbled and became like dead men. The angel spoke to the women. You must not be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He's not here. He has been raised, just as he said. Come here and see the place where he was lying. Go quickly and tell the disciples, he has been raised from death, and now he is going to Galilee ahead of you. There you will see him. Remember what I have told you. So they left the tomb in a hurry, afraid and yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them and said, Peace be with you. They came up to him, took hold of his feet, and worshipped him. Do not be afraid, Jesus said to them. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So I want to invite Martin to the lectern to speak God's word to us. Father God, bless Martin in his word to us this morning. Open our hearts to receive it to your glory. Amen. 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 
zero hour. Les sheltered in the sand dune. The enemy forces had driven him and the 400,000 Allied soldiers back to the coast. They had their backs to the sea, there was nowhere to run to. Behind the sea, in front, the houses of Dunkirk, the homes demolished, thousands made homeless, devastation, refugees fleeing, destruction, capture or death. The German guns could be heard, they were not far away. A stray dog wanders by. He was miserable, so was I, said Les afterwards. History was not on his side. Les was at ground zero. There was not much hope as my father and the other troops awaited they knew not what. Zero hour. Moses looked at the Red Sea. The Hebrews could see it too. The dust from the Egyptian forces swept towards them, their backs to the sea. Where could they go? Maybe some wanted to surrender, but then what? Slaughter? Death? At best, a return to slavery? But better that than going back to Egypt, some thought. Death by sword or death by drowning. It was a zero hour. Hope had gone. History was not on their side. They were at ground zero. There was no sign of hope as Moses and the Hebrews awaited. They knew not what. Zero hour. Mary looked at the cross. She had had such hopes. Her son Jesus had transformed the lives of so many, given life, raising the dead even. Now he was stolen away from her by the Roman forces who had seized her son and nailed him to the cross. She was at ground zero. She looked at her son. She could barely bear to look as the screams and wailing welled up inside her. In front of her, the waters of death awaited her son and awaited her also. And behind her, life alone. She could hardly bear it. Life was no longer worth living. History was not on her side. All she could do was wait, and what she awaited she only knew too well. Zero hour. Another Mary looked at the grave. This Mary came to the grave to say her final farewells to the one who had given her life back to her. In front of her was the stark reality of the waters of death, which had engulfed Jesus, and made all the worse by those who had desecrated the grave by stealing Jesus' body away. They had not even left her the comfort of a body to anoint and to mourn. Life was wretched. She had seen in Jesus that God does not punish for sin, rather God delivers from the sin that destroys. And had she not been wonderfully released from the demons that tormented her? But now it was the worst demon of all, death, that tormented her. And in front of her, the waters of death engulfing Jesus, history not on her side. Behind her, what was there to return to? So she remained there, weeping. What else to do? All that she had loved had been destroyed stolen from her. She was at ground zero. And over her shoulder, a voice. Woman, why are you weeping? Thinking it was the gardener, Mary turned round. They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Mary, the voice says, and she turns, it is Jesus. Master, history was not on her side, but God was. God not bound by cause and effect, for God created him. God not bound by history. For history has been downhill since Eden. God not limited by evolution, 
for we have evolved into a pretty mess. And Paul, writing, thinking about the Hebrews by the Red Sea, as he has alluded in the previous chapters, thinking about the cross where he has been in the previous chapters, thinking about the resurrection morning as he has been in the earlier part of Romans chapter 8, he writes, in view of all this, what can we say? If God is for us, who can be against us? Certainly not God, who did not even keep back his own son, but offered him for us all. He gave us his son. Will he not freely give us all things? Who will accuse God's chosen people? God himself declares them not guilty. Who then can separate us from the love of Christ? Can trouble, hardship, persecution, hunger, poverty, danger or death? No, in all these things we have complete victory through him who loved us. For I am certain that nothing can separate us from his love, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor any other heavenly rulers or powers, neither the present nor the future, neither the world above nor the world below. There is nothing in all creation that will ever separate us from the love of God, which is ours through Christ Jesus, our Lord. For the Marys, it was ground zero of a new day. For Mary Magdalene, forbidden from embracing Jesus, she embraces the new dawn of history. For the Hebrews, ground zero of a new life to freedom, as Moses steps forward, the waters of the Red Sea opening, and they embrace the promises. For Les, the ships of the Royal Navy arrived, backed up by the flotilla of pleasure cruises, and hope returns, and the planned rescue of 45,000 becomes the deliverance of 338,000. And Les decides to learn to swim. History may not be on our side, but in Christ, if we are in Christ, God is. And there will come a day when parents will not wail beside a coffin that carries the corpse of their child. For the trumpet will blast from heaven and the earth will birth bodies resplendent in beauty. There will come a day when undertakers will laugh at being forever out of work. There will come a day when the shame that sticks to us will be washed away as we stand smiling before God who has made us whole. There will come a day when refugees skip down the road into their new eternal home, where joined with all those of other races, they feast on the lavish provision. There will come a day when the wolf dwells with the lamb, and every knee and every tongue be united in confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There will come a day when the worst days of our lives will vanish like a dream. Death will be dead the grave buried. There will come a day when all those who believe in Christ will see the dawn of the first day of the new creation, the dusk of which will never come. And there will come a day for each one of us when we can know this for ourselves. Beginning now. There is only one way. Do not just listen to Paul's words of hope. Do not simply hear them here or at a funeral. Do not simply go away saying, we heard inspiring words from Paul. These are the words of someone who knew what it was to face death, who knew what it was to see death, who knew what it was to be in the middle of the worst that hides behind our TV screens every night. Zero hour for you and me as well. And God speaks to us. And God opens up the way in the midst and despite the worst of the suffering and cruelty of our world. And there is a way through the waters for each one of us. And that way is Jesus. And Jesus goes ahead of you. And God's word not only nestled in Bethlehem, 
but is nestling already in your heart. It is there already. What is that word saying to you? Obey it. Welcome it with meekness, as did the wise men, as did the shepherds. For that word that already nestles there is the word and the way that leads through the waters forward in hope to life eternal. These things are not born of history. These things are new creation, and God alone does it. Amen. Amen.